Thank you for joining us for We've Got Issues. I'm Nancy Furness, and I'm here with my co-host, Brad Nickerson. And we're filming today in Coquitlam, so I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Coquitlam First Nations ancestral, territorial, and unceded territories. We thank the Coquitlam peoples for continuing to live on, on these lands and to protect the lands, the oceans, and all that lies above and below. We'd also like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for making this program possible. So today we're joined by Eric Minty, and Eric is running for Port Coquitlam City Council. So thank you so much for joining us today, Eric. Hi, Nancy. And I was wondering if maybe you could just start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and also what inspired you to run for Port Coquitlam City Council? <laughs> not not short answers to those, but I'll, I'll you know I'll try to summarize. So a little bit about myself, uh, and uh, I mean I've I've lived in Port Coquitlam for for the last 25 years. I moved here when I completed my uh, engineering degree uh, at SFU and um, and got a job here and and decided like really decided that this was a place I wanted to raise a family, and it's that it's that that sense of community that you get. Um, and you don't get that everywhere, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's it's such a, like y y you get that it's it's almost like a small town feel, but in Metro Vancouver. And and it's it's a little bit unique. It's this unique. It's a unique vibe here. And you're and and you're close. You've got the Poco Trail, and you've got the like all these different places around mm -hmm. um, where you have that. You're 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 close to you're close to nature, but you're in the city as well. And you know maybe like you know downtown, you know, uh, the West End or whatever, we have that, but there's not too many places where, so you get that sense of community, but there's also this, this kind of um, uh, community spirit. Um, and you see that when, you, well, yeah, I mean, you see it especially when, if you've got kids and you, you know, you get involved, and you get mm -hmm. roped into coaching the soccer team and, and that sort of thing. And so, I mean, I've spent a lot of, I spent a lot of years, uh, you know, volunteering in one capacity or another, whether it's, you know, coaching or refing. And um, I don't know if you know, but I, I, uh, I, I built the uh, soccer referee program that we have uh, ah. in the, uh, the community soccer program we have. So, um, and like brought in the mentoring and scheduling and things like that. So I was very proud of that. Um, but you get involved with other, you know, other community things. Like a friend of mine uh, was a cancer survivor, and he said, "Let's do the, let's do that, uh, let's do that cancer ride." And so we like, ran, we rode together for about seven years, mm -hmm. and we raised like fifty thousand dollars for cancer research and things like that. And then, or you know, like, so, you know, if it's like a, you know, a shoreline cleanup or those sorts of things, it's like it's it's so much it's it's joyful mm -hmm. to to get involved in in making your community, uh, you know, better in in you know even just small ways. Well, that's, um, thank you. So that's wonderful. And can you tell us um, what inspired you to run for City Council? It sounds like you're very involved in the community. And what made you decide to take that jump and, and to make a run for uh, municipal office? Um, I kind of came about it, I, I, I never really came about that sort of intentionally. And there's a, a few things that have come together to sort of make that possible. Uh, and because it's not an easy thing to do and it's not an easy commitment to undertake. Mm. Um, but also, you know, what was the inspiration? And I don't think there was one single moment uh, other than, you know, at, at some point in my life I realized, uh, you know, you hear about, you know, you hear about climate change and, and, and you're sort of in the background and you're thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll do my part and you know, I'll recycle more and, you know, kind of like ride my bike more often. And then I realized at some point it's like, my individual actions are never going to be enough mm -hmm. to make a change. And you assume that somebody else is taking care of it. Right. Uh, and, and, and to a large extent, that's true. But there's a lot of things that aren't being done that could be being done. So there's a lot of missed opportunities. And mm -hmm. as you dig more into that, and, and I found myself going down that journey. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get more politically involved. I, I actually wanted to start out by volunteering on, a, on an election campaign. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, who, who in my community do, do, I, do I feel like I could get behind and support? Um, because I didn't really know anybody. Uh, and so I, I looked at, the, I knew there was a provincial election coming up, so I said, well, let, let's, you know, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's look at the different parties. And, and so I got, um, uh, and they all had things that I liked, and, there were, and they all had things that I didn't like. But one thing stood out for me mm -hmm. is when I went over to the, the BC Greens website, and they, I wasn't, I, I didn't see what I was expecting to see. I saw core principles. 
Okay. Right? And then maybe that's like part of my German ancestry is like that resonates with, right? But mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, other, the other part of it was fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that, I wasn't expecting to see that from the Greens. And I thought, well, that, so I wanted to learn more. And right. then I got involved and I discovered that there was like amazing people involved. Uh, and so that one thing led to another. I ended up becoming, you know, like organizing a local team. And, and because of the work that I had done organizationally, uh, you know, the party called me up and said, hey, we've got a snap election. We need a name on a ballot. Will you do it? And so I said yes. And it was like, I like to say it's like swallowing the red pill, you know? <laughs> like it opens up your eyes so right. quickly to everything that's going, not everything, but it's, it's like drinking from the fire hose. You know, there's so much information coming at you. And, and I was like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but I learned a lot and that inspired me. One thing I realized was I have a passion for public service. And so then I got involved in my strata council and started doing that work <laughs> and was inspired by that work. And one thing led to another. And then I came to realize the things going on in your community, a lot of that, is really rests on having a strong um, collaborative uh, city council. Okay, and, well, and so, you know, there's a lot more to that, but it, like I said, it wasn't one single decision point, but it was a lot of factors that led me to that. And then my kids growing up and I've got more time available. And Right, so it sounds like it was um, a little bit of a, a journey to get to It's been a running, journey, right? And, but, and yeah. I'm, it's, it's, it still is. <laughs> well, it, it's, no, that's great. It's, um, thanks for sharing that with us. And I just wanted to go back a little bit to one thing you had mentioned about um, being interested in, in the climate and yeah. climate change. So Port Coquitlam does have a climate action plan on, in the works. In um, the works, yeah. In the works. And I was wondering if maybe we can talk a little bit about that as being one of your areas of interest. So what, what do you see as being the risks as far as climate change um, brings to, to the city of Port Coquitlam and what kind of actions would you be um, bringing to the table as a city councillor? Those are big questions. Um, Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. No, this, this is why we're here, right? Big and important. Uh, they are important, <laughs> right? Because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is an existential threat. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I, I think the two biggest risks involved are um, uh, the the immediately obvious one is uh, the, the the flood risk. Right. We're, we are the majority of Port Coquitlam is in a is in a floodplain. Right. Um, we've got rivers going around and under and wherever and even over. Right. We've got atmospheric yes. rivers too. Right. So we've got rivers everywhere and we've got water flowing and um, there's drainage is a constant threat. Mm -hmm. Flooding is a constant threat and it's going to get worse. We know that. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities to, to do more, you know, and, and I'm not saying that these things aren't in progress already, but right. that is certainly a risk that needs to be given more attention than it has in the past. Um, the other one that I think most people don't realize is um, the, the risk to mental health. Okay. Climate change is a mental health issue. Uh, climate anxiety is a real thing. I mean, you hear tragic stories about people you know, committing suicide because they're so distraught about the state of climate. Right. And, but even on a, on a small level, because people feel, uh, people feel powerless to do anything about mm -hmm. it. Or, or they, you know, oh, I'm doing my part. Or, you know, so, so that, that whole mental health anxiety, you know, climate anxiety is a real thing. And I think it's, um, I don't think it gets enough attention. So how do you, how do you feel that as a city councillor, you could address that? Well, the easy, I mean, the easier one to address, the, the easier one to address, obviously, is, um, uh, is the floodplain management. And, and there are things that we can do. This is not my area of expertise, but I think that's something that uh, needs to be given more, more attention than it has been. And, and from what I've heard, plans are in the works to, to divert more resources towards that. So that's good, and I, I would love to be a part of that. Okay. Um, and in terms of mental health, I think that's a much larger issue mm -hmm. than then we have time here to talk about. But that is that is definitely uh, a, an issue that's rising in importance across BC, across everywhere. 
Uh, and so I hope that there's more resources available for mental health. Uh, and, uh, but I think if, if the city is shown to be actually doing things, um, you know, pr like sometimes providing more green spaces, that can help or providing more outlets for people. I know there's like, there's a, something like a four year waiting list for community gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't a lot of spaces available for community gardens, but there are some, so let's take advantage of that. Uh, and that helps with food security. and everything. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do. And, and sometimes it's enabling people to become, a, to, to, to be of service to their community that can also alleviate their own mental health because they know that they're helping somebody else out. That's, and and that, that, that's that intrinsic joy that comes from being of service to your community. One of the, one of the ideas that, that I have, and this is like an early, I'll, I'll share this with you, um, that uh, is uh, we, we know when we have extreme weather events, for example, that you know, there, there, there's a lot of focus and attention rightly goes towards uh, people that are in, you know, in, in homeless situations or, you know, in, in housing stress situations. But those aren't the only people that we need to take care of. Um, there are people that are living in our community, they might be your neighbor. And because it's such a, you know, it's essentially a bedroom community that we have, um, and it's, it's changing, but be, you don't always get to know your neighbors. And your neighbor might be an elderly person that, you know, we have a heat wave or we have, you know, icy conditions or, or whatever, that they may have difficulty getting out or getting around during the pandemic. There certainly was a lot of that. Um, and what you saw during the pandemic was neighbors helping neighbors just to say, hey, do you need help getting your groceries? You know, and, and to have kind of a community volunteer program where there's, a, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues that would need to be worked out about that, but some kind of a community volunteer program where we're looking after the most vulnerable members of our society, whether or not they're in housing stress, not like being in a nice house, but they just can't get out when the hot weather or, you know, or extreme weather events. So do you think that there's a role that the city could play in those volunteer programs? Could certainly program? facilitate getting that mm -hmm. going forward. That's the kind of initiative that the city doesn't necessarily need to run, right. but you can provide tools and resources to people. Um, to uh, you know, and help get a volunteer group off the ground, um, mm -hmm. and uh, or you know, bring the right people together to make that happen. That that would be a, a phenomenal um, program to be introduced in the community. That kind of bringing people together and getting them to cooperate within neighborhoods. It builds but, community too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, it'd be a fantastic thing. But um, at the same time, you know. How how would you the opportunity to do that do that exact thing has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. and people have talked about that in the past, but yet it still doesn't get done. How would you bring your how would you work with your council to encourage that kind of thing that thing that has been left behind for such a long time? Like how That's how would you work around that? And that's one of the beauties of working on a council is that is, is that if you can establish that collabor if you can establish that culture of collaboration within a council and, and a council of seven, or you've got a mayor and six councillors, yeah. is the ideal it's it's really kind of the ideal team size. And I've done a lot of consulting and just so that you understand my background as well. I've I've spent years in uh, sort of the um, uh, software engineering management space as a consultant working on exactly those kinds of teams mm -hmm. and developing those teams to become high functioning, high performing, um, collaborative, independent teams, mm -hmm. right? For those familiar with the space, it's agile, uh, it's agile development. Um, and I've seen those transformations take place and I have led those transformations. So uh, those concepts transfer very well to a lot of different environments not perfectly but you can you you know they're very transportable and i i feel i've always felt that a you know a city council because of its size is the ideal way is the ideal format to collaborate on those exactly those types of things and so what you do is you create an open space of trust you establish that trust within uh within that council 
Mm -hmm. And that can take effort, but once you've mm -hmm. established that, then you can bring forward ideas and say, how can we collaborate on this? Mm. So if we can maybe just um, talk about City Council a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of interaction or should, I think, be a lot of interaction between Council and constituents. Um, you're talking about it being a good team, uh, City Council. How would you ensure that constituents are kept in the loop on some of the issues that are really important to them. Yeah, and, and that's not isolated to city council and it's not mm -hmm. isolated to Port Coquitlam. Yeah. Um, that there is often a disconnect between the people that are in service and the people that they serve. This is common throughout mm -hmm. human societies, right? So uh, the short answer to your question is you know, there there are tools available that we can use. Um, we just have to go and do them. So these are things like town hall meetings, mm -hmm. right? Where you can go and you can have community town hall meetings. We have a number of different communities throughout Port Coquitlam. So you can have community town hall meetings like in your local high school gymnasium or whatever and, and invite, bring people out for issues. You can even have Zoom community town hall where you're inviting feedback from people, where you're asking people to just share your thoughts or maybe it could be topical. Um, and a, a lot of the volunteer groups that I've worked with uh, have, because I've worked with several, um, they do these. You know, it's a town hall meeting and people are, you know, invited to, you know, bring their questions and comments. You've got maybe a guest speaker that draws people in. Uh, so those kinds of formats are really good for getting public input. Um, and, you know, I, you know, and I know that they'll, they'll solicit, like, they'll solicit things through, uh, you know, through web forms and things mm -hmm. like that. It's not necessarily accessible to everybody. Um, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the climate, uh, you know, the climate mm -hmm. action plan. There's a very extensive survey that the city of Port Coquitlam put out, and I put a lot of time into trying to complete that survey. Mm -hmm. I never ended up completing it because I had way too much. Like it, mm -hmm. the, the survey was too extensive, and so it was like, ah, I just, I, there's no way I can compile all the all my thoughts onto here. Right. Um, so I'm going to find another way of communicating that. Right. So, so would can, a town hall be a good a town way hall to carry that? A fantastic way of, mm -hmm. of collecting feedback. Um, one of the other things, um, uh, a number of years ago, Port Moody did they did an open house, right? So you go to city hall and they had displays and they had the, like their staff there to answer questions. And they had like a board where you could put your ideas and things like that. It was very participatory mm -hmm. and very, uh, you know, it was a very two way conversational and engaging, right? And that's one of the fundamental principles of democracy that we're often yeah. missing is that public engagement and getting people excited about government. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, getting people excited about government <laughs> of course because that's what affects your day-to-day -day life right. you know and and you know we talk about politics as though it's a bad thing but really when you're doing it right it's just people getting together and talking about things that matter to them so pre the town hall mm -hmm. how are you going to get people excited about government yeah i mean, think in port coquitlam it's like 25 or 24 percent of people came out and voted in the last municipal election a lot of people there's a lot of reasons why people don't vote mm -hmm. I personally feel um, a, a lot of people talk about apathy, voter apathy. Mm -hmm. I think a stronger, and this is just my own personal opinion, I think a stronger thing is disenfranchisement. Okay. Because people see, well, I voted for this person last time mm -hmm. and nothing happened and nothing changed. It's not true. Things did change. You just didn't know about it because the, that communication barrier is there. So we're back to transparency. We're back to and, transparency. Yeah. Right? How do you break down those barriers? Yeah. And so you, it, it requires a conscious effort. And you have, to, you have to put a lot of effort into communication. It's not an easy thing. So I can mark you down as a fan of Tri-City Community TV. I can. <laughs> and, this is one thing that we can do to get you know, to spread the word. I'm just wondering if on your platform you believe in supporting Tri-City Community TV with, say, a grant or something like that. <laughs> we, can, we can have a conversation about that. Because <laughs> okay. I think that could excite people. In the well, it would excite us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to circle back a little bit, if that's okay, because mm -hmm. I... I I just, you had talked um, a little bit about Port Coquitlam and having a small town feeling yeah. um, and that sort of thing. I'm wondering, what's your vision for Port Coquitlam? Like, there's been some changes. We've seen a lot of trees come down, um, something that's personal interest 
to me. Oh, um, the it, city core is A lot of people changed. are upset about some of those a trees lot? that came down, yeah. Yeah, so what is your vision? Um, yeah. How do we keep some of those big trees? And, you know, we know they're important for climate change, for our mental health, our physical they, health. How they do we, are. How do Especi we retain and, and you're especially we're talking about the, you know, the, those big mature trees, mm -hmm. right, that, that provide a lot of benefits. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm going to point to a couple of examples uh, and and I, I wasn't intimately familiar with them, but you, you read it in the news and, and it's like, oh, this is a good thing, right? So it just to point out that it is possible. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple of development permits that, that were asked, they, they asked them to go back and, and rework it to say, okay, rework your application so that you can preserve the, that tree that's on the property. And so they'll work the design around the existing tree. Like, yeah. so that you're treating, the, you're treating that mature tree, like some trees are small or whatever, and you can, the, yeah. it's, it's not a big deal. The, you're talking specifically those really big, it's a big mature healthy, trees, mature right? mature trees, right? Yes. That it's gonna take another 60, 80, or 100 years for yeah. that tree to return those benefits back. You plant a new tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so you can, Sometimes, not always, but sometimes you can, if with a little bit of effort, treat that tree as a piece of the landscape, mm -hmm. as a piece of the land, and say, let's, let's be a little creative and rework the design around that. It's not always going to be possible, but let's ask the question. Let's make that a habit to say, ask that question, treat those big mature trees as part of the landscape. Mm -hmm. And how do, we, how do we work with that instead of just removing them as an, as an inconvenience? Yeah, so maybe to start thinking of them, um, sort of placing a more of value and... Well, and there actually is a system, there, there is a methodical system in place for doing that. It's called natural asset management, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And, and not everybody gets the importance of this, but it's like we know that we have engineered assets and they provide a tangible monetary value to the city. Well, natural assets, and you're talking like trees or forested areas or uh, you know, or even uh, you know, ditches or berms or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, any of those natural features provide a functional, measurable, financial benefit. And there's also intangible benefits, but you can at least yeah. measure the tangible benefits. And there's a structure and a framework in place for be able to do that. Um, and that's something I, that I think that's an initiative that's being pushed by uh, Metro Vancouver, and and so that's coming into the municipalities and. And, uh, but I, you know, I'm a huge fan of that. And I think that's something that needs to be added to the balance sheet so that we can make those informed decisions based on data. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a data geek. <laughs> <laughs> I can ask you a question. Maybe this is a really big question, but um, can you just maybe give us a vision of, of what you yeah, think totally. of, you know, Port Coquitlam as a livable community or livable neighborhoods. Right. Like what, what, how do you see that? So. If you look at our downtown core yeah. is, and the way that's developing and emerging, right? Yeah. Is that's a good model for the other communities within Port Coquitlam to sort of move, move in that direction where you have, um, it, it's just the, like the right amount of density, you mm -hmm. know, where you've got kind of low, you know, low mid rise buildings, whether it's condos, townhouses or whatever. Okay. Um, and you know, mix in that commercial space. I'm a big fan of mixed use. It's commercial residential where it makes sense right. and we could do more of that um, and e you know even like let's let's see if we can find some opportunities for pedestrianization of streets that is something that I know business owners get wary of they're like whoa we need more parking we need more people driving in their car on like you look at Shaughnessy Street right they're sitting in their car because there's congestion because of the traffic and there's no way those Shaughnessy Street right now is, is trying to do two things. It's trying to be a thoroughfare and a destination. And it doesn't do either of them very well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there, there's, I, I'm not gonna pretend that there's any easy solutions to that, right? right? But if you look at that vision, right? So if you have, I, I think we've, we're, we're making a reasonable start. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that model, you can look to European cities for a model, for example, right? Where you've got, you know, you've got this community that you live in where you can live, you know, live, work and do most of the things you need to do. Um, and you're connected to your neighboring communities, right? We have a number of different communities within, within Port Coquitlam. Uh, and you're connected to those by a network. It's a multi-mode network, right? And we have somewhat of a multi-mode network, you, but your basic options to get around are a car right. or uh, a bus. You're kind of taking your life into your own hands if you ride a bike, 
I ride a bike mm -hmm. just about everywhere. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's some dodgy places, right? Yeah, yeah. But there is, there's lots of opportunities to provide better cycling infrastructure. The more people we can encourage to get on bikes. Mm -hmm. Remember that slogan back from like 20 years ago when they had those stickers on the bikes? One less car, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Every bike is one less yes. car. That's one less car on the road. Um, and so that's one big thing we can do. Um, I know that there's there's been a big announcement recently about, uh, you know, eventually they're going to you know bring SkyTrain to Port Coquitlam. I think that's a conversation we need to have with people because okay. um, SkyTrain brings a lot of benefits, uh, but there's a lot of concerns with it. I mean, there's you know there's noise and there's crime and there's a whole, you know, other things that come with it, right? So, do we is that is that the right decision? Mm -hmm. So maybe something that needs. A town hall and some public consultation. Right before we make those, mm -hmm. I mean, these are multi-million dollar commitments, mm -hmm. right? And SkyTrain is horrendously expensive, mm -hmm. right? There are lower cost, like rapid transit alternatives that we could start exploring. That some of them might work really well in Port Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, as it happens to be, we're starting to run very short on time. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the last thing I'd like to ask you, Eric, is. A, because, and I'm sorry that we're running out of time, um, maybe you could sum up some of your the most important priorities that in this particular election that you're interested in. We can wrap up with that, knowing what your priorities are going to be for this, for the community if you make it onto council. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's a lot of things already in progress, and, and, and I recognize that. Um, but I, I do think probably one of the biggest things that we need to worry about is floodplain management. If we don't take care of that, um, we are setting ourselves up for um, a disaster. A disaster, right? Yeah. So that's like one of the most immediate things, like all hands on deck type, right. of, uh, type of things. Um, and I'm very aware that, those, that that's already happening. Um, but yeah, let's, let's have some more town halls about, because there, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of big, you know, big ticket projects that are that are on the horizon that are coming where there's been some of them have had more some of them have had less and some of them have had no consultation at all with the public um, and they're going to affect your community so let's get some real community engagement let's let's have some town halls let's even you know we could we used to have well we can have some committees where you have more citizen engagement right um, I think there's one which is like the you know the the mayor's roundtable and that maybe a good place to start and we can do a few more like that. But to have um, focus committees like one on the environment? Some, some right? focus committees but make them more open and inclusive rather than you know just uh, like citizens. rather than having to apply and like mm -hmm. to have it you know a little bit more open where you can um, where you can gain like if I'm an interest if I'm really interested in um, uh, you know pick a topic like trees you're really interested in trees so let's have a round table on trees or something. Um, Sign me up for that. <laughs> so a place where the stakeholders are much more engaged. I'll, I'll give you, and I'll give you a, a real, uh, a real life example of that. There's a lot of work that's being done by, if you're familiar with the the uh, Tri Cities Housing and Homelessness Round uh, uh, Task Force. So they've they've got, uh, I mean, they're they're doing a tremendous amount of uh, of very valuable work in the community. But if you if you talk to the residents that live nearby the homeless shelter in Gordon Avenue, right? They are terrified because they have so many problems with, uh, they, they have so many problems with like security within their, uh, and, and they have a lot of compassion for the people that they feel aren't being given the uh, support that they need, but they don't have the answers and they feel that their voice isn't heard. So again, this, again, it comes back to that communication. Let's have it, let's start there with a with a town hall. Let's hear their concerns and let's get those people connected with the people that are actually doing the, that that work and really good work within the community um, to hear the concerns of residents. I know that they are to some extent, but if people don't feel heard, then they're going to be disenfranchised. I think by having that public consultation up front, you um, take away a lot of the pushback. And the other that's exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens because you know they may not agree with you, but at least if your voice is heard, exactly. you're less likely to object. So, uh, I think I think that bodes True well as, as quite an exciting place, uh, an exciting idea for any community to to 
to have somebody on council who really wants the people to be heard um, and consulted with with the things that are happening and to create that um, that community engagement that I think so many people are really interested in. like what you said getting excited about government so that's that's great and Eric I, I really thank you for coming today well, and sharing that vision with us and um, giving us an idea of who you are and what you want to do on our council because we need to know that as we move towards the election so hopefully we can talk to you again in the future I'd um, love to and I appreciate it again. Thank you for coming. Thank you, guys. So Thank you. that's pretty much it for us for today. Um, thanks again to our guest, Eric Minty, and thanks to Tri-City Community TV for allowing us to, um, to be here and present We've Got Issues. Thank you for viewing us today.